Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Ahsoka Episode 4, Fallen Jedi, a title that applies to Sabine's surrender to her emotions, Ahsoka's literal cliff dive, but really, it's us who have plunged into the world between worlds to reunite with the fallen Jedi Anakin Skywalker, or so we think. This realm in which the Force connects all of time and space was actually seen in Rebel Season 4, Episode 13, when Ezra Bridger pulled Ahsoka Tano through time, saving her from her Season 2 duel with Darth Vader, and I cannot believe we are now seeing it in live action. We're in an earth-shattering moment of Star Wars, folks, so let's take this scene by scene for all the details you missed. I translated runes, I analyzed sounds, I literally spent eight hours writing this through the night after an eight-hour shift of a normal workday, and I did it because I love this, and I love you, and I'm so grateful that you support what we are doing. And by the way, if you have not seen Rebels, I don't judge you. It's okay. We made a four-part Rebels recap series for this reason, to catch you up on everything you need to know. Our season four breakdown is now incredibly important, so please check it out. Okay, we open this episode with the usual faces of Vader, 3PO, Clone Trooper Helmet, HK Assassin Droid, Maroc, Hu Yang, a Stormtrooper, Chopper, and Sabine's Helmet. And every week, Sabine's Helmet has been flashing the color red. Now we realize, perhaps signaling her giving in to save the one that she loves. They're still stuck on the planet Cetos. A word that I want to thank Metal Dog 14150 in the comments of last week's breakdown for pointing out is rooted in the ancient Greek, where Sito was the goddess of sea monsters, leading to the Latin Cetus, which means whale, and also the name of a constellation. So we're going to be doing more to chat with you folks in the comments, so keep those great insights coming. And one of the very first lines Sabine says this episode, Where's Ahsoka? Outside. And that is where we leave Ahsoka at the end of this episode, wondering where she is, and only knowing that she is outside of our realm of existence, in the path of danger. Now the trees of Cetus are red-leaved, reminiscent actually of the crimson outgrowth formed in the Clone Wars Mortis arc when the celestial deity figure, the Sun, attacked to separate Anakin and the sister from Obi-Wan and Ahsoka. If that sounds like gibberish to you, again, watch our Rebel Season 4 breakdown and recap it there. But basically, the gods of Mortis are a trinity of deities, the father, the daughter, and the son. The son represents the dark side of the force, the daughter represents the light side, and the father, the balance in between. Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan encounter them in this realm that's called Mortis, and a lot of stuff goes down, but basically, the daughter transfers her life energy to Ahsoka and lives on in the form of a bird called Morai. The gods of Mortis return and rebels as the gatekeepers of the world between worlds on a mural that's discovered on the outside of the Jedi Temple of Lothal, and it was the daughter's open hand that Ezra Bridger followed to Loth Wolves, who moved in a circle, opening a portal to this cosmic realm. So it's kind of important to know these gods. Now, Ahsoka is really standing outside to avoid a difficult truth with Sabine. If we can't make the journey to find Ezra, then no one should. We should talk about this. Ezra Bridger's name has always carried an important meaning, as Ezra means help or helper in Hebrew, and Bridger establishes this Jedi as a connective bridge. In seasons two and three of Rebels, it seemed to the dark side of the Force, but really, in season four, proved to be a bridge from this realm to the world between worlds, and now in this show, a bridge to Peridia. And Ahsoka fears, perhaps, a Pandora's box that is not meant to be opened. Ahsoka says, Better that than allowing Thrawn's return as heir to the Empire. Ah, heir to the Empire. Of course, a shout out to Timothy Zahn's 1991 novel that introduced Thrawn as a character to Star Wars. Thrawn was considered the heir to the Empire in the old Star Wars continuity before that was retconned and was brought back into canon during the Age of the Empire in Rebels and now reclaims that position as the Imperial Grand Admiral that all former Rebels fear. Now, Disney Plus has gotten really creative with their closed captioning for Ahsoka because after Ahsoka says heir to the Empire, we hear this music. And the closed captioning describes this as thoughtful music playing. Thoughtful as in Sabine has to kind of chew on this, but also Thrawn is the most thoughtful thinker in Star Wars. Ahsoka is not looking forward to being outmaneuvered though. Is everything all right? Be careful out here. Yeah, something definitely stirs, and Ahsoka looks to the left, and as she turns, her laku dangles in such a way to kind of look like a gust of wind is sending a shiver down her spine. It's like she senses something, a presence she has not felt since. Shin Hati and Marok approach Morgan and Balin's skull as they look out from the Cetos ruins, and listen closely here. 
Yes, you can definitely hear Purgle in the sky above. Morgan and Balin watch with some trepidation though, because remember, those hyperspace whales did not exactly help their side in that chase last episode. While this episode ends with the Eye of Scion blasting off on this path of Peridia, I am guessing that Hera, Jason, Chopper, Ahsoka, and for the love of God, better be Zeb and Rex too. Whatever's left of the Rebels crew is gone to follow this yellow brick road the natural way and ride some Purgle to Peridia. Balin tells Morgan, you best get underway soon. Is that a note of fear in your voice? Experience. So we later learn this episode that Balin totally knows that Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader and that Vader's former apprentice is not worth sticking around to face. Sabine now wears her Mandalorian armor with the rebel insignia on one pauldron and on the other, a purgle. So this was the new color design that she took on in the Rebels final episode epilogue. She also wears these Mandalorian van braces, which look customized from the ones Finn Rao gave her in the Trials of the Dark Saber episode. And she checks her blasters, each of them a West Star 35, which are the blasters she uses in Rebels. Hu Yang surveils the tree line and we see the droid's eyes narrow into these squinty eyes like kind of a Clint Eastwood checking out the horizon and I love it because it honestly shouldn't make a difference for a droid's photoreceptors it actually would make things worse but it just characterizes him as kind of human-like so I love it an HK droid attacks and Hu Yang holds his own surprisingly well for an architect droid designed to teach Jedi younglings about lightsabers but Hu Yang uses his upper shoulder arms to defend himself we actually saw him grievousing with these while training with Sabine in episode three but Hu Yang uses one of those upper arms to break the motivator to turn the power off and alert Ahsoka and Sabine. In a busted motivator, sound familiar? That's how the droid R5 got Luke to take the droid with the message from Leia instead in A New Hope. This R2 unit has a bad motivator, look! Busted motivators, gotta love them. Now, when they're outside in the firefight, when Sabine is shot into a defensive standstill, Ahsoka shifts gears and pulls this insane combination. She no look stabs the guy through the face over her shoulder, then she force lifts another guy into the line of fire of a shooter, killing that guy in the tosses his corpse aside to let Sabine use her van brace to lasso the last one right into Ahsoka's saber. This is definitely some dark side moves here, and it shows that Ahsoka also is letting her attachments to Sabine bring out some darkness in her. So we wipe to home one in the New Republic fleet as Harrison Dula and her son Jason join Chopper on the way to the ghost, and Jason, remember, is the son of another fallen Jedi, Kanan Jarrus. And he actually wears the same green pauldron that Kanan wore throughout the Rebel series, and it has Kanan Kanan's symbol, and this symbol was seen on the head of the loath wolf named Doom, D-U-M-E, sharing his name with Kanan's birth name of Caleb Doom. One unresolved mystery about Kanan from Rebels is the question of whether he might have been brought to Lothal as a youngling by Yoda, Kiati Mundi, and Mace Windu, foretold by the markings depicting those figures on a wall in that cave that the loath wolves led them to in Rebels Season 4 Episode 7, Kindred. If that's true, that would give Kanan a similar mystical connection to the planet of Lothal, its Jedi Temple and the Loath Wolves that Ezra had, making them a kind of kindred through the Force. And now Jason, as the son of Doom, who also gets bad feelings akin to Force sensitivity and wants to be a Jedi, also would share in that kindred spirit, whatever it is. Jason asks, Mom, how come I have to do what I'm told and you don't? What? What the fuck? Yeah, it kind of sounds like Chopper says, well, because she's boss. We see how the ghost is joined by five X-Wings, and I love how their shadow crosses over the top of that CR-90 Corvette at the bottom of the screen. Such amazing attention to detail there. In this fleet, if you look in the background, you can also see an EF-76 Nebulon B escort frigate, which first appeared in Empire Strikes Back. I love seeing all these ships from the original trilogy. X-Wing Captain Carson Tiva, played by Paul Sun Hyung Lee, returns to the Mandalorian. On your signal. Phoenix leader. Ah, Phoenix leader. He's recalling Hera's role as commander of the Phoenix Squadron during Rebels, which could be a sore subject because Hera in Rebel Season 4 led an attack squadron of the green painted X-Wings as the Phoenix Squadron leader that led to a nasty defeat by Thrawn and her crash landing on a Lothal that resulted in Kanan dying to rescue her. But hey, before that, I guess a lot of good memories in the Phoenix Squadron. We meet some other pilots, including Lieutenant Basie, who's played by Michael C. Alexander, with a green and yellow helmet, a Rodian Lieutenant Moat, played by Don Dininger, a longtime special effects crew and costumer on many major titles, Lieutenant Jensu, played by Chow Namova, who's a stunt performer, and Lieutenant Lander, played by Brendan Wayne, who, along with Latif Crowder, does all the physical work for Din Djarin in The Mandalorian. Now, Brendan is actually the grandson of John Wayne, and while we're at it, Diana Lee and Osanto is the goddaughter of Bruce Lee. Don't call these Nepo babies, they are stunt actors, and no one in Hollywood busts their asses for their craft more than they do. And I love how Hera does a good mama move that every good pilot who writes 
smugglers run at Galaxy's Edge does, lets the co-pilot punch it into hyperspace. Now, we do this George Lucas clock wipe, and it's centered perfectly on the center of the Eye of Scion. And if that's not a clue that this hyperspace jumper is also a kind of time machine turning back the clock, I don't know what is. Now, unlike in Episode 2 when Balin looked up at those clouds and saw Pergil, here we do not see Pergil, but we still hear them. That might be because those mystical animals no longer want to assist these users of witchcraft. Balin warns. For the jump we're attempting, if your calculations are off by even a little, we will be lost to the depths of the void. Yeah, Balin seems to be referring to a void between galaxies, which sounds like a kind of buffer zone that you can't even jump into hyperspace from. Morgan tells Balin. Have faith. Now, it might just be me, but it kind of sounds like there is an echo on her voice, similar to that of Mother Talzin, the Night Sister, when she spoke in Clone Wars. I believe you have a question for me. Have faith. Now, Balin responds to this. Faith. I lost that a long time ago. Yeah, we're still wondering about Balin's origin as a Jedi, and what, other than the Purge, would have caused his falling out. Now, there's more interesting closed caption descriptions when Morgan activates the sphere. Ominous whispering. So the additional voices that Sam Witwer, Helen Sadler, Matthew Hood, and all the others are contributing, I think might be these. Voices of the Night Sisters and the Night Brothers calling out to Morgan from the path to Peridia, and perhaps the world between worlds, because these sound like the Night Sisters from Clone Wars. Balin just takes all this in. Witchcraft. It's interesting that Balin says this, because back in episode one, he told Shin not to discount everything Morgan does as witchcraft. What thread is she spinning? No, it's not witchcraft. But here, using Night Sister sorcery to illuminate the path to Peridia, to him is witchcraft, and he senses that something is unnatural about this. Now, I pointed out before that this hollow dome star map points a golden path through a ring marked with Pergil, but I just counted now that there are eight of them, which, when aligned with that Eye of Scion in the background and its seven hyperdrives, eight is more than seven, and it could suggest that this pod of Pergil is a more natural and more effective way to hyperspace travel this route. On the Eye of Scion, Morgan's droid up uploads this map information on the segmented disc that looks like an old school real life constellation map. The screen on the right kind of looks like a digital sextant, a device used by astronomers to measure distance for celestial navigation. And the wedges of the star map screen light up yellow throughout the episode like pieces of a clock and recalling the Rebels navigation map of the Death Stars that orbited Yavin to get within range of the Yavin 4 base in A New Hope. Makes a really effective visual clock throughout this episode. But if you count these, in total there are nine sections that they have to complete and figure figure out as pieces of the path to Peridia. The number nine could correspond to the nine realms of Norse mythology, since that is a recurring motif on this series, with Skull and Hati being named after the wolves of Norse mythology. And if you watch my video where I translate all the different runes on the path to Peridia in the closing credits, the next stop on that path to Peridia is a planet called Odin, O-D-Y-N, Odin being the supreme god of Norse mythology. So Ahsoka and Sabine run into Marok and Shin, and like last time they fought, Sabine is the first to make the move, she rushes in. Now to her credit, Sabine is better with her blasters than she is with her lightsaber, so she's initially on the offensive against Shin. She has pretty good aim, shooting the tree right where Shin's foot just was, but Shin does a pretty strong force push that forces Sabine into close quarters so that she has to draw Ezra's lightsaber. Now, meanwhile, we do cut back to the ruins, and we briefly see some runes in that alphabet that we started to decode in our closing credit star map translation that, again, you should watch, but this one is Veil of something. I thought it was Veil of the Force, but it is not that, trust me, even though the Veil of the Force does connect to what we get to with the world between worlds. And thank you to Better help for sponsoring this video. We here at New Rockstars love analyzing things and we're pretty good at it. If you want to understand why a certain character acts a certain way, we can tell you that. But if you want to understand what's going on with yourself, you should talk to a professional by using BetterHelp. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. Whether you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just going through a rough patch, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. If you click the link in the description, you'll see how easy it is to sign up and get matched with a therapist. To get started, just answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with a therapist from their network that's right for you. And if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist at no additional charge without stressing about insurance, who is in your network, or anything like that. If you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com newrockstars to help support this channel and get you 10 
10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Ahsoka duels Maroke, and she's far more patient. She raises her lightsaber over her head in a vulnerable open position. We think it's the same pose that Anakin takes with Dooku in Attack of the Clones, but she does this to bait Maroke into spinning his Inquisitor lightsaber, and Ahsoka waits for the right moment and slashes Maroke real fast. It's a lot like the very quick duel between Obi-Wan when he killed Maul in the Twin Suns episode, but then this happens. I know, I know. Huh? The closed captioning is exploding hiss and screams. Screams means several voices are mixed into one. So the green vapor means we are looking at Night Sister sorcery, like the green flame that Morgan uses to activate the sphere, the green colored Night Sister ghosts that inhabit the Night Sister temple that Maul resided in on Dathomir in Rebels season three, episode 11, Visions and Voices. It's pretty much confirmed, folks. Maroc was not Ezra. He was not Starkiller. He was not Barriss Afi. He wasn't even the Shistavanian Jedi like I pitched, even though I think that might have been the most evidence-based of these wacky theories. He was most likely a Knight Brother, a male member of the Night Sister cult, because dissipating into green vapor is exactly what happens to Maul's brother, the Knight Brother Savage Press, when he was killed by Darth Sidious in Clone Wars Season 5, Episode 16. If he's not a Knight Brother, he might have just been a corpse animated with Night Sister magic. The screaming sound when he dies reminds us of when Grievous slaughtered the Night Sister clan in Clone Wars Season 4, Episode 19. <laughs> Now, with this Dathomir connection, could Morok have been Maul? No, just stop. Why do people think this? Maul's death in the Twin Suns episode of Rebels was such a perfect end for the character. There is no way Dave Filoni would ruin that, his own work, by bringing Maul back this way as like a Knight Brother spirit just to kill him off like this. Also, Ahsoka knows Maul. She fought him before. She would have sensed his presence. Maroke was just Maroke. Let's move on. The one interesting thing about this is that he is the first Inquisitor we know of who was not a former Jedi, which is kind of weird. Balin tells Ahsoka, Everyone in the Order knew Anakin Skywalker. Few would live to see what he became. Surely that must leave a mark. Is that why you walked away? Abandoned him? Ah, so Balin knows Anakin became Vader. How does he know this? Maybe he's very perceptive through Night Sister magic, or maybe it's something he learned from Morgan Elsbeth by way of Thrawn, because Thrawn deduced from various subtle moments through subtext in books. I also just can't help but notice the probably unintentional wordplay there. If you would see what he became, surely that must leave a mark. And you know, what Anakin came would leave us with a mark. Now the runes behind Ahsoka in this moment translate to Orbit of Occlusion, which is a nod to the Outer Rim Occlusion Zone referenced in the High Republic comics. So they ignite their lightsabers. <laughs> This is fascinating to me because Ahsoka's saber pitch is higher in tone, and I'm pretty sure these two harmonize. You have Balin's here, and Ahsoka's here, which is a fifth above it, here and here. So despite their opposition, their lightsabers produce this pleasant harmony, a fifth harmony, you might say. You hear it especially in the shot where Ahsoka sidesteps and Balin appears in the foreground. And after their initial clash, Balin takes the same batter up ready stance as Qui-Gon Jinn, who is also a complex figure in his relationship with the Jedi Order. Now there is a moment when Ahsoka locks sabers with Balin, but Balin doubles down and shoves her blade back just with brute strength. And from here, he has the upper hand. Like Ahsoka whiffs, pulling a real Sabine there. And then Balin does this little mid-air twist. Looks awesome. And from here on, you see Ahsoka's tactics changing. She goes from fighting Balin to just dodging his thrown boulders and reaching past him for that map sphere. Meanwhile, Sabine tries to force push on Shin, but really Sabine's outstretched hand was just a ploy to put Shin in the crosshairs of her Van Brace missile, a Mandalorian trick that Kanan Jarrus scolded her for during Trials of the Darksaber. Balin really pisses off Ahsoka by saying, Your legacy, like your masters, was one of death and destruction. And now Ahsoka gives into some dark side rage with Chun-Li kicks. She grabs the spear and the Night Sister sorcery burns her hand. Now later we see her hand and it does kind of look like that map might have been burned onto her palm, like the headpiece of the Staff of Ra in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, Lucasfilm loves to just reference itself. When Ahsoka sees Shin without Sabine, she assumes Sabine is dead and she force chokes Shin, slamming her against a rock. Yeah, we're seeing raw dark side energy from Ahsoka. Not a good look. And it might 
might be her starting to dip into this that really sucked her into the world between worlds and what is waiting for her there. Balin drives Ahsoka toward the edge and overhead, you can see the runes on the ground translate to 2100. It's literally the number spelled out in letters. So maybe this is a distance in like parsecs to Peridia, I don't know. So Sabine threatens to shoot and destroy the sphere, but Balin switches things up and appeals to her through a non-violent path. Yeah, it kind of seems like Balin is responding to a horn in the musical score, like he's sensing a connection to Sabine, appealing to her emotions. I know you feel that Ezra Bridger is the only family you have left. Your family died on Mandalore because your master didn't trust you. Whoa, this is new information. We last saw Sabine's family, including Ursa Wren, Tristan Wren, and Aldrich Wren, alive and well in the first two episodes of Rebels fourth season, but not anymore. R.I.P. House of Wren. But Moff Gideon's Night of a Thousand Tears his purge struck Mandalore with fusion bombs, which now must have happened after the Battle of Endor between 4 ABY and 9 ABY, sometime after Sabine joined Ahsoka in that Rebels finale scene. So now we know the reason for Sabine's anger toward Ahsoka is that Sabine believes she could have saved her family from that bombing, but Ahsoka refused to let her go. Balin offers Sabine the chance to reunite with Ezra if he joins her. It's a similar test that Ezra undergoes with Emperor Palpatine in the Rebels final episode, but whereas Ezra resisted that temptation, Sabine gives in. And it's a big mistake that she feels right away because Sabine starts gasping from Shin's force choke. Vengeance probably for what Ahsoka did to Shin. Violence begets violence. But you know, Sabine is feeling that reward for joining the dark side. Sometimes the wind gets sucked out of you. Balin destroys the sphere and the Eye of Scion rises from the Cetos atmosphere and the Phoenix Squadron engages. Lock S foils in attack position. Yes, the same order given by the Red Leader in the Battle of Yavin in A New Hope. Lock S foils in attack position. And just comes back again and again in Star Wars. But Morgan doesn't engage. She just orders to jump to hyperdrive and we're worried because even though the hold of maneuver hasn't technically been invented yet it is kind of a hold of maneuver but just because the ring is too big it just kind of leaves this insane wake <laughs> holy shit this hyperspace wake causes at least two of the x-wing pilots lieutenant basie and lieutenant moat to collide it's kind of hard to tell but it kind of looks like lander might have gone down too and it kind of seems like carson tiva is okay the other one's either jensu or lander we will see but jason says mom i i've got a bad feeling Hey, welcome to Star Wars, kid. Of course, it's a nod to the recurring, I've got a bad feeling about this line and pretty much all Star Wars titles. But in this instance, Jason's force sensitivity is telling him that a Pandora's box was just opened. And here comes the good stuff. We transition from an overhead shot of the Cetos ruins and the waves cross dissolving into ripples of stardust. We don't even realize initially that we've gone somewhere new. That's how smooth the transition is. And that's how smooth it was for Ahsoka because she finds herself on a glowing path in space with lines streaking across the sky. This can be only one thing, my friends. It is the world between worlds from Rebels season four, episode 13. It's a cosmic realm in which the force connects all points in time and space. Now in animation, the pathways are glowing in white, but here they are blue and they ripple like water, which connects them aesthetically to Cetos and the Purgle and the blue watery tunnel look of hyperspace. Now, when Ezra Bridger goes into this realm in Rebels, he hears echoes of lines from Star Wars past, present and future including the sequel trilogy. It's crazy. He sees Ahsoka through a portal in time back to her season two duel with Darth Vader. He pulls her away from Vader's killing blow. In a way, he closes the loop as this justifies how Ahsoka was able to survive that. Now, Ezra mistakenly wants to try to use this to prevent Kanan's death, but he learns that he cannot change the past. Palpatine sees them through a portal and he tries to snare Ezra with blue fire. Ahsoka goes back to Malachor. Ezra uses the mural of the sun to destroy the temple. Now, Dave Filoni has said that he doesn't see the world between worlds as time travel. He didn't want to leave it open-ended, but rather he kind of sees it as a one-time way for Jedi to see through time. But you know, Ezra did kind of affect things. So my man, that's the kind of time travel. And now it seems like Dave Filoni has reopened the box. So will Ahsoka go back in time and change things? I don't know about that. This could just be how Ahsoka looks into the past or looks into the future. If it is indeed true that Thrawn and Ezra are in a different time, because Morgan Elspeth did say that Thrawn was calling to her through time. Ahsoka in this episode 
told Balin that she didn't want to talk about her past, and he said he wanted to secure the future. So a battle between the future and the past. And for Ahsoka, this is all about the past. And again, this is not Ahsoka's first time in the world between worlds. When she first entered this realm, her bird, Morai, was already there waiting for her. It was the daughter specifically who opened the portal for Ezra, and the daughter lives through Ahsoka. Now, the world between worlds isn't supposed to be accessed through death or near death in Ahsoka's case, but Ahsoka's connection to the daughter, plus the witchcraft that was being used on that pedestal, and the overall mystic nature of these Cetos ruins, and what Ahsoka goes through this episode, her flirting with dark side power, may have caused Ahsoka to dive into her subconscious. Now, Dave Filoni has likened her with Gandalf, and this could be like when Gandalf the Grey dies, falling off a ledge, fighting the Balrog, and then he returns later, enlightened as Gandalf the White. The episode titled Time to Fly could have been Ahsoka's Fly, you fools! So who would be Ahsoka's fire demon? Well, from the Mortis arc in Clone Wars, the god the Sun lived on through... Master? I didn't expect to see you so soon. Anakin. Oh, Sky Guy! Wait, what's wrong with your face? Hayden Christensen is back! I love it! Snips was, of course, Anakin's nickname for Ahsoka in the early seasons of Clone Wars when they often butt heads. And I love how Anakin appears over her left shoulder just as he did in Rebel Season 2, Episode 18, Shroud of Darkness, when Ahsoka sensed visions of Anakin and Vader in the Lothal Jedi Temple, her guilt working through her choice to abandon him in the Jedi Order. Ahsoka, why did you leave? Where were you when I needed you? Do you know what I've become? Now, Hayden Christensen has been de-aged for this, but I think he was meant to look a little ghostly and just off. Because A, the animated version of Anakin was really the Anakin that Ahsoka knew, and B, I don't think this is Anakin. Like at first glance, we think this is Anakin right before Revenge of the Sith, when Ahsoka said goodbye to him in Clone Wars Season 7, the last time they saw each other before he turned into Vader during the events of Revenge of the Sith, essentially the essence of Anakin that died when Vader took over. Sure, 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 I get it, I get it. It's the Force Ghost. That George Lucas weirdly put in in that 2005 DVD special edition of Return of the Jedi, and everyone was really mad. But look closely at his lightsaber. It's hard to tell, but at first glance, this looks darker than Anakin's lightsaber, almost more like Vader's lightsaber, which is similar in structure, but it has more black pieces throughout the hilt. It is possible that the chrome of Anakin's hilt is just reflecting his dark robes and reflecting the dark surroundings, but what's throwing me is the silver clip at the center of it. I don't know if that part would be so brightly silver while the rest of the hilt is that dark, and the chrome of it not even catching any of the blue light that Anakin's skin is catching. And to be clear, the silver clip is not how the saber attaches to his belt. The hilt hangs from the pommel like most lightsabers do. Now, Anakin does bear the scar that he got from Asajj Ventress during Clone Wars that he had in Revenge of the Sith, but there's just enough here to think that he is sus. Also, he has this ghostly blue pallor that recalls the blue fire used by the Emperor to see into this realm. It's the same Sith sorcery that he used to try to corrupt Yoda's mind through a connection with Dooku when Yoda was on Moraban in Clone Wars Season 6. Now, the world between worlds and Rebels is not known to have ghosts in it. In Mortis, Obi-Wan talks to Qui-Gon, but in Rebels, world between worlds, it's just supposed to be voices. So I think, since Morai, the representation of the daughter was already there for Ahsoka, and this realm is totally linked with the Mortis gods, it is possible that this Anakin is not Anakin, but is a form of the sun, a representation of the dark side, as that Mortis arc and Anakin's connection to the sun was really a moment that foreshadowed Anakin's destiny as a fallen Jedi. Now, this lightsaber may just end up being Anakin's lightsaber, but if there's something suspicious about it, who knows? It could be a disguised form of the Dagger of Mortis. And if Sam Witwer does have a live action role on this series, I don't know, having him play the Sun would be perfect casting, as it would justify why we've been hearing his voice in the mix. Now, I think episode five is gonna allow Ahsoka and Anakin to reconnect, give us that visual again, at least at first, but it may give way to a duel if this ghost Anakin is revealed to actually be the sun. Because the final seconds of the episode hint that we are in for a dark side take on Anakin. Listen closely. That is 100% the notes of the Imperial March, Darth Vader's theme. Ooh, what an episode. Comment down below with your theories on what this Ahsoka series plans to do with the world between worlds and with fake Anakin or Fanakin. Or how about Anna Skin? Anna Skin? 
Maybe we'll work on it. Support our channel by grabbing an Ahsoka inspired Fulcrum shirt available at nerdriot.shop. Be sure to subscribe to The Break Room for episodes of Wookie Leaks, our Ahsoka after show. Subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network. And hey, thanks to Noah Chen for helping write and research this breakdown. Follow me at EA Boss. Follow New Rockstars. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.